figuring out what products to sell on Etsy is easy for some, but not so much for others. If you're coming into it as a crafter, your biggest problem is probably gonna be just narrowing it down. But some people will come to Etsy with really no attachment or prior experience with creating things. So they'll be looking for something that is going to give them the most return for the least amount of effort. Or maybe you've already started selling on Etsy and you want to change what you're selling. I did that myself and it worked out. So if you're thinking about it, maybe give it a try. This is episode four of my How to Start an Etsy Shop series or grow an existing one. You can catch all of the current episodes linked in a playlist in the description and I'll add the new ones as they are posted. In the last episode, we talked about finding your niche and your target audience for your shop. And that process sort of goes hand in hand with product research, though I think it's easier to come up with a niche or a category first and then figure out what products fit within that niche or that category, instead of starting with one specific product and then trying to build a niche around that. If you already have experience making the things that you are planning to sell, you can probably think of some more items that you can make with the same materials, methods, and equipment, supplies, whatever you have. Having to keep stock of fewer materials will help you buy them in bulk or wholesale quantities easier and therefore cheaper. We talked a bit more about that in the last episode as well. But let's say you have no idea what you want to sell or what products you can add to your current list. Honestly, your best place to look for ideas is Etsy. So in a marketplace setting like Etsy, you're going to have competition. I know the sky is blue. You're going to have competition for pretty much any niche on any platform or any other place you sell things. This is capitalism. That's how it works. So don't let that get in the way and instead use that to your advantage. This is not the early 1900s. This is the 2020s. You don't have to hire a spy to go check out the shop down the street to see what they're doing. You can literally just push a few buttons. I know I generally say looking at competition is bad, and it is when you compare yourself. So you're not trying to see why your product might be failing at this point. Right now, we are just looking at what's out there. Don't pay attention to their prices or their photos necessarily. You can get a general sense of what kinds of products that are available to make that you maybe weren't aware of. And I am not saying at all to copy anybody else. Please don't, okay? But as you mess around in the search and use different keywords or different things to try to figure out some other things that you can make that are similar to yours that would fit within your niche, and you'll start to see patterns and the same shops come up over and over. I think this is a very important step that you may be like about to cancel me because I'm telling you to look at other people's shops. But from doing this, like making videos for I don't even know how long I've been doing this. Like, oh yeah, literally a year and a half. <laughs> and answering questions from people who are starting an Etsy shop or about to start one, or looking, like doing reviews in the past of people's Etsy shops, it is very clear that a lot of people start an Etsy shop and seem like they have never even gone to Etsy.com. So they maybe don't know how shipping works or like how things look on the buyer's side. So if you're going to start an Etsy shop or any other place, platform to sell things, you should probably have used it yourself first. I feel like I shouldn't have to say that. Like obviously you don't have to go and buy from a bunch of people, but just browse, like just shop for things. Look at how the website is set up and what customers can see. And you may start to pick up on things in other people's shops like, oh, hey, they didn't do this very well. Maybe they could have explained this a little bit better or this photo could have been better. Maybe that's just me, I don't know. But you, either way, <laughs> go browse Etsy for a little bit. And just a side note, if you're going to do this, which I again suggest that you do, especially if you buy things on Etsy yourself, use an incognito browser and don't be logged into your Etsy account because Etsy's recommendation system, if you start searching for your keywords that you're going to use for your shop, they may not be things that you're interested in buying, obviously, because you make them. So it's going to mess up your recommendations. <laughs> and then it's going to start to get biased based on the things that you click on. So it's going to keep recommending the same shops over and over again. And there are apps out there to do product and keyword research that take away that layer of 
the recommendations and stuff on Etsy and just give you what a normal user would see without any kind of personalization on it. Do I personally use our E-Rank and Allura? They're not absolute necessities, but they can be helpful. They can give you insight on products that Etsy itself cannot, such as the sales history of a specific item or the popularity of certain keywords over time. So if you want to use them, they are a good tool and kind of like hiring a spy to check out the shop down the street. If you're new to Etsy or e-commerce in general, you may be like, what the heck is a keyword? This is the golden ticket to basically being found in search. A keyword is a very short summary of what your product is. And this tells search engines like Etsy in our case, or even Google, where your product or that web page fits within a search. And the keyword is part of search engine optimization or SEO, but it's not all of it. Because SEO doesn't just take into account your keyword that's in your title. It also takes into account your description, your tags, and other information on the web page. And learning how to write and come up with all that is going to be several separate videos, so we won't get into that too deep right now. But all you need to know right now is, number one, your keyword needs to be as perfect of a match to your actual product as possible. And number two, your keyword has to be something that people are going to be searching for and wanting to buy on Etsy. So you could think of it as the term that somebody would type type into the search bar to try to find that item, but it's a bit more than that. Your keyword and your SEO and things like that are also going to feed into Etsy's algorithm and tell it kind of what your item is and help it to recommend that to people who may be interested, even if they don't search for that item or that keyword specifically. So the algorithm or the computer system behind where and how the products get ranked in the search and what gets recommended to which users it's going to be constantly looking for information about what different customers are doing. So like for me, for example, like Etsy algorithm is like going to target my recommendation feed and the emails they send me in marketing to what I am interested in. And it's going to relate that to other people who are interested in similar things. So they'll say, oh, if you are searching for this thing, then you're probably gonna like this kind of thing also. So essentially why I'm talking about keywords and not products is you're going to take those keywords and then use those to create products. So I think this is a better method to coming up with products than browsing your competition because you won't be like subconsciously influenced by their listings and then you can come up with your own design to fit that keyword. And honestly, you might come up with a very similar product to somebody else regardless of which method you use. <laughs> I am almost certain that nobody on Etsy invented the craft or the method of which they make things and they weren't the first person to actually make that item themselves. But your job here is to make your product better or stand out somehow in comparison to other people's. Whether that's more appealing photos or more options for customization or more value for the money. While it would be impossible for me to tell you exactly what products you should list, I can tell you a few things that you should consider when trying to figure it out. First and foremost, do you have the skills to make this item already or can you learn? Or are you willing to learn? Is probably a better way to say that. Most crafts and creative things take a bit of time to get good at or get used to, or at least be good enough at to feel confident selling an item that you made. And if you're using machines like a Cricut or a 3D printer, or Glowforge, stuff like that, they're gonna have a little bit of a learning curve. Or if you are looking at doing digital products and you've seen those videos that tell you how easy it is to make millions of dollars with digital products, which are bull crap I talked about previously. Or if you're doing a print on demand or something like that, do you have the necessary skills and ability to use programs like Photoshop or Illustrator. In the case of my shop, when I switched niches, I got a new sewing machine that I had never used before. And it was a different kind, like most regular sewing machines are kind of, kind of operate similarly. But I got a serger, which is completely different. And it took me a long time to produce a product that I was confident in selling that didn't look like absolute garbage. The second thing I think you should consider is how long this item is gonna take you to make and if you're gonna be able to make a decent wage by selling that product. This was a big reason that I decided to switch niches because my old niche 
did not give me a good return on my time and it was also physically demanding so I had to switch gears. The third thing you should consider is will you be able to source the materials cheaply like in bulk or wholesale quantity and will you be able to get those quickly? Let me just let you in on a little secret. The solution to getting cheap materials quickly is not waiting until Joann's has a sale and then going and getting your materials from the store at Joann's. Your profit margin is going to be extremely low if you are paying that much for your supplies because Joann's is a retail store or same with Michael's or whatever your craft store is called, same difference, because they are getting the products from a manufacturer and then marking them up sometimes 75 to 90%. So you are still paying a lot more than you should when you could be getting them directly from a manufacturer or a supplier. So you could do that just starting out to see if it's viable, but keep in mind for a while, your profit margin is gonna be very low if you're doing that. You can still get an idea of the pricing of materials in bulk and wholesale quantities. Just do your research for suppliers beforehand and then you can place an order with them when you are ready. And why I said you need to get them quickly because I know the feeling of having all of a sudden a lot of orders and my shipments are nowhere in sight. And here's some advice that I know I have never mentioned before. I never heard anybody else say this, so listen up if you are making handmade things. If I'm making a new product to add to my shop and it's not just something I already have in a different color, before I ever commit to selling it or even consider putting it in my shop, I will first make a mock-up or several mock-ups or prototypes, if you will. That way there is no doubt as to how long it's gonna take you to make or how much the materials are going to cost. And for those things, you should not guess. So go and actually time yourself making a few of them. Figure out the exact cost of the materials you use down to the penny or even like a fraction of a penny. That includes your thread, glue, staples, transfer tape, whatever else. Your first few products can be made with scrap materials or things that you can clean off and reuse or something, depending on what it is. Just make sure to do your pricing research and everything with the exact final materials that you would use. You can also test the product before you start selling it to people to make sure that it handles being used and washed. Sometimes I'll come up with the product, I'll start making the mock-ups, and I absolutely hate the design or realize it's not feasible to sell for a decent profit or the process of making it just ends up being a pain in the ass if it's too complex. After that, I'll occasionally bring something to the shop after I make a few adjustments. As an example from my actual shop, I sell scrunchies and I could not for the life of me figure out how to join the tubes together without having to hand sew them and you really don't want to be hand sewing things because it's not very quick. So I finally found a method to not doing that because I try not to look at other people's like tutorials and patterns and things. But eventually I was like, you know what? I am not hand sewing these freaking things. I'm going to figure out how to do it on a machine and I did. <laughs> well, I was doing it with a machine and then I didn't like how it looked so I tried hand sewing it and it looked better but I was like, this takes too long, you get the gist. <laughs> and another snag I found in the past is that I did try to come up with a product before I found a keyword for it. There was a certain kind of product that I added to my shop. I nailed down the design, made mock-ups, did my pricing and all of that stuff. It was they were actually the very first product that I listed on my shop after changing my niche, believe it or not. And I was kind of marketing them as like a multi-use thing, but it was too difficult to get traction to them because I didn't know which keyword to use because there were so many different ones I could have picked. Those ended up doing better at in-person craft shows because I could explain that they are multi-use instead of like people trying to search for something and it not being the right thing. Now let's talk about personalization and customization. You will need to decide up front if your customers can somehow change or personalize your listing for each one. And you absolutely do not have to offer this. I don't because it does not make sense for my products. But if you have an item that is commonly personalized, like tumbler cups or baby onesies or certain kinds of jewelry and things like that, customers may expect to be able to add like an initial or a name or a short message or something to that product. And we'll go more in depth on how to logistically handle this when you make listings in a future episode. But for now, you should just decide if you're going to offer this at all and what kind of things you're going to offer. So will it be just 
initials? Can they just change the color? Will you offer a hand engraved message for something like a trinket box? And figure out how many characters will fit because that will be important when we make the listing later on. So if you're like making rings and you're engraving, you probably cannot write like a 10 paragraph essay on the inside of a ring. I mean, if you can, that would be pretty cool, but impractical. Or will you work with customers to create a completely personalized design? Or will they just have a set list of things they can choose from? And even if you don't want to offer customization or personalization, just know that I will personally guarantee that you will be asked several times to personalize or create a custom product, whether or not you advertise that you do. I suppose that's kind of expected on Etsy to a certain degree. It's like some people who shop on Etsy want everything to be custom and bespoke, while other people who shop on Etsy want us to be Amazon. One thing I'd like to note that can sometimes get lost in translation when talking about things like this is to be careful of what you pick. Of course, if you are just trying to rake in the money, there are going to be niches that generally perform better than others, but that is not the only thing you should consider because that does not mean you will enjoy that niche. I personally am very notorious for finding and very quickly ruining any new hobbies I have by trying to turn them into businesses. You do need to evaluate if you are willing to risk a bit of disdain for your hobby in exchange for some cash, or if it is a hobby that you are like personally attached to, are you going to be willing to adapt and change how you do things? Maybe your craft is sentimental to you or traditional in some way. If your shop starts to grow, your process is going to pretty easily become less and less personal if you're not careful. I am going through a little bit of disdain at the moment with my current niche. I learned how to sew when I was maybe six or seven. So that's been 20 plus years. And it's been a hobby off and on since then. But the things I actually enjoy making are things like clothing or something that is a bit more in depth and more creative. And of course they take more time. So I'm glad that I chose to make things that are fairly simple and generally just square shapes instead of all the curves that clothing has. But even with that, I still ended up kind of bored after a few years. And I'm not saying you're absolutely 100% going to hate your hobby if you try to make it a business, but it takes some effort and self-reflection to make sure you don't get burnt out or tired of it. And that's a big part of the reason why I don't take custom orders or customize my listings. So the next question is going to be, how many products should I start with? Or if you already started a shop, how many should I have? As with many things, there isn't a hard and fast rule that you should follow. I mean, you physically can open an Etsy shop with just one product, but I wouldn't. What I would do is start with at least 20 listings right away and then have more on like on deck basically in your drafts to post at regular intervals, whether that's every day, every two days or once a week. And that's gonna be to just grow your total number and keep your shop active by adding new listings because the algorithm is going to favor new listings but just for a little bit though. I have an older video that explains pretty well in depth about how many items you should have in your shop and why that is. I'll have that linked at the end of this video and in the description. Okay, a little addition to a previous episode that I wanted to give you an example of. So in episode three, we talked about your niche and your target audience and why that's important. So I have this can here that's been sitting in the background. And if you've seen that video, you may remember that knowing your target market or your target audience is very important. And even toilet paper brands have different target markets. I don't know why, why can't I say that word now and not when I was recording the other one? I don't know. <laughs> but also things like water have different target markets. When you're probably familiar with like Fiji water and then there's like Aquafina, for example, those are two very different people are trying to reach with those. But allow me to show you liquid death if you are not familiar. So this is the mango chainsaw flavor. I have seen Liquid Death around, but I never tried it because I like LaCroix and I thought it was kind of similar. So we can tell a lot about the target audience of Liquid Death by just looking at this can. So right away, even just from the name of the company itself, clearly they are going to be 
a bit edgy, calling water liquid death because water is usually associated with life. And I love things that are like backwards or counterintuitive. And the artwork on it is also a melting skull. So that's going to be targeted to people who may enjoy skulls, probably not your granny. Although if your granny does think this is cool, then that's cool as well. Their tagline at the bottom is murder your thirst. I like reading these blurbs on food packaging, by the way. It says this ruthless tall boy of flavored sparkling water is armed with, is armed with agave nectar and natural electrolytes to refresh your body and murder your thirst. And below that, it says, hashtag death to plastic. We donate 10% of the profits from every can sold to help kill plastic pollution. I, 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 is that why it's called liquid death? Death to plastic? And it's in an aluminum can? What? So like I was saying in that video, your target market is going to influence everything about your brand and your products, even down to the words you use to describe them. And since the brand is Liquid Death, they are using the death murder kind of theme on everything on this packaging. Even the name of the flavor is Mango Chainsaw. They could have just left it at mango, but no. This is not sponsored by Liquid Death. I bought this at Sprouts myself. If they want to holler at me, let me know. <laughs> Click over here to find out how many listings you need to have on Etsy and how often to add new ones and why. And I will see you next time for episode five.